Today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a very special day. A milestone in the building process of our young industrial design department. We uh, uh, will see and hear today the inaugural lecture of uh, Professor Kees Overbeke. And that will be uh, this afternoon at four. The aesthetics of the impossible at four. So the aesthetics of the impossible. That means at five, we all know what is behind this very interesting title. But before, before that, we start with a small uh, symposium. Symposium uh, with very interesting, uh, I must say, uh, speakers from the field of design. And uh, I'm sure also very interesting uh, discussions. But uh, first of all, a very warm welcome to, to all of you. We are uh, glad and proud that you are all uh, uh, here. Design and uh, especially the, uh, that part of the field of design where we are so interested in is today here in, in this lecture hall. Uh, Kees, you have the lead for the rest of this afternoon, not uh, just your own lecture, but also to uh, uh, bring us from this start up till uh, where your lecture starts. So uh, uh, you have the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, you, you Schouten, Nadine, and the exact person we need for this job. Now it's my go. I'm a bit nervous, I must admit. But anyway, first of all, we'll have, I think, a very interesting symposium. And without further ado, I would like to start the symposium. The speakers will speak for about half an hour, and then there will be time for questions. Please prepare your questions. These are interesting people, but I think we should try to get the best out of them. And the best out of them we can do that by having interesting questions. Okay, our first speaker is <coughs> Bill Buxton. And Bill Buxton has been everywhere. He doesn't like us to speak about his curriculum because he's done too much. Anyway, he has a special affinity with the Netherlands and we are proud and glad about that. Bill is currently working at Microsoft and he's going to talk about, and I have to, from object to experience, redesigning design. Bill, the floor is yours. Um. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be back uh, in the Netherlands. So I thought uh, I'll leap right into uh, my topic. And I want to talk a bit about observations I have on in, in design. And in some sense, uh, if we could have the slides. Mag ik de diapositive, alstublieft? Which one? And uh, voila, even kijken hoor. So uh, I thought I'd just pick a beautiful house as an example because I wanted to contrast industrial design, not as it is supposed to be, but maybe how it fell into compared to architecture. And I think the. It's really interesting because architects certainly design houses or buildings, but actually they are designing something for you to, ex a way for you to experience your life. And so in some sense, good architects have always spent as much time understanding the types of behaviors, the activities, the values that we have when they start to do our buildings. The form is important, but the form is something to invite you to the experience. 
And in many ways, if you look at um, even what we call in automotive design, for example, um, it's styling rather than design in many ways. And it's the form has taken precedent, the object has taken precedent, not the lifelong experience. A house is not something you buy and replace as a consumer electronics device, for example. And so when we look at something like uh, a chair, uh, the, the design, um, first it's a piece of sculpture, second it's something you sit in, but in many ways the focus on the human here has more to do with physical ergonomics than cognitive ergonomics or cultural ergonomics, although certainly there's a part of that. But while this type of furniture has a great deal of adjustability and adaptability, it in another sense doesn't have behavior and that has to accommodate or, or bring about uh, sort of larger pictures of larger degrees of complexity. And when we look at uh, design, there's, my sense is, and, and maybe it's more of a North American perspective, is that it's almost a materialistic thing. It's as if, we, it's as if the things we sell are objects. It's about the, the physical thing, the physical product. And so I wanted to just take you for a bit of a bicycle ride. Uh, this is my mountain bike. This is, uh, um, it was designed by a friend of mine named Michael Sagan at Trek. Uh, it was designed for a guy named Roland Green, who is the world champion uh, mountain bike cyclist. It's beautiful, it's carbon fiber. And this is a very objective view of it. And I think that if I go to the second rendering of the bike, different color, there's something happening here in terms of the rendering, just how it's presented. In a sense, because it's at an angle, it's not this objective view. Um, it's got shadows. It's starting to have character. And for me, this reminds me of some of the Pixar films, if you've ever seen Red's Dream or things. But where the, it's not just a, a visualization of the object, but it's starting to give a visualization of the character of the object. But what's interesting is this is not what you buy. I said that was my mountain bike, but that's actually not true. That's the thing I own, but that's not my mountain bike. The thing I own isn't my bike. This is my bike. And if I was to say what is the better, the best of the three renderings of what you buy when you buy the object, this is the best depiction of, of a mountain bike. And what's fascinating to me about this, and it's the same mountain bike in all three pictures, but in this image, what's great about it to me is you can't see the bike. You don't know what brand it is, you, don't, you know nothing about it. You know nothing about the materials, you know nothing. All you know is that when you buy the bike, you're buying the chance to scare yourself to death, to have adrenaline pumping through you, to not be sure whether you're going to come back wet or dry, and but the one thing you know is you will have a smile on your face going from ear to ear. And, and then have a beer or something. But what's, what's critical is, is that in many cases with design, there's a much deeper thing here going on in terms of experience. And this is my sense about when we talk about experience design instead of product design, the reason is, is that we're trying to capture this notion about how from the very beginning of design do you make sure you keep your focus on this and not on the form, not on the object, not on the materials. Those things are all secondary. And, and this leads for me in terms of how I approach things is, is this very much is my fundamental belief about about design and about what I do. And it's just that we're deluding ourselves if we think that the products that we design are the things that we sell rather than the individual social and cultural experience that they engender and the value and impact that they have. And this notion of value is really fundamental to this, as well as the emotional side. Um, one of my heroes is a, a not very well-known historian of technology named Melvin Kranzberg. And Kranzberg has a number of laws, but his first law, which is my favorite, is this, technology is not good, it is not bad, but nor is it neutral. And I love that because it says to me that as a designer, as soon as you acknowledge Kranzberg's first law, you realize that every single thing that you introduce into the culture is in fact an act of action of 
social engineering and social design and cultural design, for which you must take responsibility or make your best effort to do so. You will not get it right, but if you do not try to get it right, you are not a designer. You are not a worthy designer. And the question is, is that it's not just the change, but it's the nature of the change and it's the values that it represents. And how do you do that? And how do you teach that? It's not just about selling product. And, and of course this brings in this, uh, you know, this question about what is design. And I met with some of the master's students yesterday and I said, I will only have that conversation tonight over a beer if they're paying for it. Because it's not a worthy conversation. It's, not, it's a, not a conversation that you can never have because we'll never answer it. But what I can say is when I'm talking about design in any form that I've ever seen it as I recognize it, we could ask the question in a different way and that is what is the archetypal activity of design? What happens? What activity do I see every time I see design as I think of it happening? And I'm happy to have that conversation. My answer is going to be simply sketching. And what's the reason, and I haven't made a leap here, there's no non sequitur. What I'm trying to say is that I've set up this sort of thing about experience, the importance of experience, the importance of values and all of these things within the context of, of design and responsibility. And now what I'm trying to get to is saying, well, how do you get there? Because if experience design is design, then it must by logic have the same attributes as design as it always has, but perhaps rethought. And so if we're going to rethink design and we're going to rethink what it is, that, and we, if, we're, if we're going to rethink design but we're not going to define des design, just its responsibilities, then at least let's look at the activities around it. And for me, that focuses around sketching. And since I want to be a historian when I grow up, the part of this says is where did it start? And we know historically when sketching began as a way of thought to solve design problems. It has a clear point in history and to the best of our knowledge of scholarship, it happened in the middle of the uh, 15th century with Tocola. And these are from his notebooks and this is the first time sketching was used that we know of where it wasn't to record instead of photography, where it wasn't used to render to make drawings or me for memory things, but rather as a means of problem solving, where you work through a series of sketches as a way to explore a concept. And so what I did for a few years is just went and read and visited and talked to designers and started thinking, well, what is, this, what is this thing called sketching and how does it fit into the larger context? And, and I'll tell you a little bit about why this is important because if experience design is design and if design as I know it always has sketching associated with it, then there must be sketching in experience design. But what the hell is it? And it, so let's go through this uh, exercise. This is one of my mobile phones. It's the HTC Dash. And since many of you are designers, you don't have to use a pencil, but if you have one, be my guest. But I'd like you now to go through an exercise, at least in your mind's eye, the pencil in your mind's eye, and say, draw my phone. Now, even if you're like me, I was trained in music, and I'm, a, I'm pencil challenged. No matter how pencil challenged you are, I am sure that there is not a person in this room who could not draw that phone in a way that it's distinguished from my other phone or from your phone and that where everyone in this room could recognize the difference. It might be like the rendering of a five-year-old child, but it will still be recognizable. Okay, that's the design of the object. So now let's make it a little more interesting question. Draw the interface to my phone. Because many of you are hotshot experienced professors of experience design and use interaction design. Sketch the interface. You've got 15 seconds. And what I'll say is all of a sudden, instead of 100% ability to render and 100% able to distinguish, I think we just came down to 5%. Just by changing from form to interface. And then you say, which is more important? And what are we teaching? And if there's 
a 95% difference in our ability to sketch the interface than it is to sketch the form, where do you think people will spend their time? It'll be on the styling, not on the interaction. But this isn't what we, but I'm breaking my rules because that's not what we're on. So now I'll give you a harder question. Draw the experience of using the interface of my phone. Okay, you've got 15 seconds. Make a sketch of the experience. If you can't sketch it, how can you design it? That's the question. If you can't sketch it, how can you design it? And if you can't sketch, you can't explore. Design is not about making a phone that works or a phone that sells. Design is about making the best phone that works the best way, that reflects the best values to your ability. And my claim is your ability is dependent upon your ability to explore the concepts. It's not about getting the right design only, it's about getting the, sorry, not about getting the design right, it's about getting the, the right design as well. And so if we say the third is there, how do we start to explore sketching? And one of the challenges in all of this is, of course, the object nominally has no temporal properties. It's fixed, it's plastic. It might have some articulation like button pushes. But time is certainly one of the parts, but it's not the only part. But let's just look at time for a moment. These are some sketches from some friends at Brooke Stevens Design. And what's interesting here is they actually, traditional industrial design does in fact try to deal with time. Uh, what I like about this is that they have a stylized model from Fomcore, which is a form of sketching and 3D sketching, which already. Where, it is, where they're only testing the articulation of this uh, baby buggy. And the other part, the technique that's fairly interesting, is just even the use of arrows to, to give time and a sense of dynamics, to try and convey the behavior. But of course, this is mechanical behavior in a limited repertoire, which is trivial compared to the dynamics and the temporal properties of the types of products that we're starting to design, products with microprocessors embedded in them that perhaps have some autonomous intelligence. There's a friend of mine named Ron Bird who has done a lot of work for Symbian and other phones. And I, I really like his work. And I want to give you a sense about this and just in terms of uh, how he approaches dealing some of these issues, just as an exemplar, because I'd say that some of the things I'm showing you are not typical of what we teach. What's typical here is that he's showing on a PDA just how to go through a sequence of, he's a sequence of screens like a cartoon or a comic book to show you in a storyboard fashion how to select a name and, and, and send a message to somebody in your address book. But if you look at this more largely, there's something far deeper here. It's not just the sequence of shots, but there's two or three things. I want you to notice that none of this is rendered in something like Illustrator. Very important. It's hand rendered, even though it was done in, in Flash. Actually, it was done in Macromind Director, but, or Macromedia Director. I, I just showed you how old I am, by the way. Um, the, that it's hand rendered to make sure you know this is a sketch. But the second thing is, notice what he's got here. What he has is a state transition diagram that shows the complexity of the whole sequence. And it shows you where you are, and it shows you where you can get to from there. And so in some sense, there's this deeper re representation of the semantic. It, it, there's, the representation is working on multiple layers here in a way that I've almost seen by nobody else. And, and Ron is the person who first let me see this. And it's, it, for me, it's, it's a really subtle but interesting way to start to capture things like complexity, things like learning. Um, this is my life. It's pathetic, isn't it? I go to my office, I go home. I walk from office to home. I run to the office. I'm always late. This is called a state transition diagram. This is exactly what you saw in the bottom of Ron's images before. Now I'll tell you a joke. Here's the joke. What do transitions and Canada have in common? They're both dominated by the states. 
In almost every case where I see people designing user interfaces or designing interaction, what they do is they might start with the state transition diagram and then they start to do fantastic detail, fantastic resolution in the states. And you see this over and over again by professional designers, not just students, where they go into Illustrator, they will make these things that look like the, the, the system is real, it's finished, and they'll make PowerPoint presentations or flash demos, and they look fantastic. But you notice, all of the detail is in the states, and there's no detail in the transitions. And then if you ask, where does the emotion come from? Where does the, where does the whole experience come from? It comes in the transitions. So the interesting thing here is if you don't have as much detail in the transitions as you do in the states, you fail. That's what will be built. And when you go and say, that's not how I wanted to get there, they'll say, well, you didn't tell me that. You didn't show me that. I'll feel better when I see things where there's all the detail in the arrows and none in the states, just to balance to show you that you can do that. But the question here is it's not just about time, but the emotional impact. It's all about how fast you go. That's where the emotion comes from, right? Or it's just really, a really boring talk. Now, we have techniques in illustration to deal with some of this. Um, this is a good one. Some people say use video, use film. If you want to deal with time, you want to show things in context. Guess what? If your airplane is about to crash, you do not want the flight attendant to put the video on to show you how to get out of the plane. Okay? There's a clear example. This is better than video to tell you how to get out. But notice there's one thing more here that wasn't in the designs of the baby carriage, that wasn't in any of Ron Bird stuff. What the new thing here is, guess what? There's people. All of a sudden, it's in context. It's not just people, people in a plane in a certain circumstance that now you can start to see. And the, and the representation actually accommodates all of that. These are really, by the way, there's a book of nothing but 50 years of history of airplane emergency cards, which is one of my favorite design books of all time. Because it's got about space, time, and context. People, everything. Now that's not a sketch. But here's the other part that I find interesting. Uh, again, those of you of a certain age might be familiar with the film The Graduate with Dustin Hoffman. You know, it's where Simon and Garfunkel, you know, think of that. This is a true storyboard. I've come to the following conclusion that 90% of the people who teach or do storyboards for interaction and experience design have never seen a storyboard because they think that a number of screenshots with arrows are storyboards. I'm sorry, I've worked in Hollywood. I have a share in an Academy Award. I understand how this business works, and those are not storyboards. Storyboards are really interesting. Notice you have this huge repertoire of arrows, not only going from frame to frame, across the frames, but even within the frame, plus text descriptions to tell what the camera's doing to make sure you've got this right. Um, and, and if you start to look at how video game and film makers actually do storyboarding, you realize it's not the same thing as a comic book. And that there are ways that you can quickly capture and sketch some of these temporal things. And importantly, you can, if I, the reason I like the film and I like the, the airline ones is that these are two different things, for very, but both of them are directed about context and about emotion and about different situations and situated work. And you can incorporate all of that into the design very early. Now there's a few things around this that I think are really interesting because it's about sketching time, behavior, and experience. And so we come back and say again, what's a sketch? What's a sketch? Because I've said already that we're sketching experience. We want to deal with values. We want to deal with context. And sketching is part of, is essential to it. And we even talked about the history of sketching, but we still haven't said what a sketch is. I'm not going to say what a design is, but I am going to say what a sketch is, according to my analysis. And if you go to one level of abstraction, by looking at the data and studying the sketchbooks of architects, of industrial designers, and, and animators, these are, this is my analysis. That they're quick and timely. They're there when you need them. They're inexpensive. So you can do them really quickly, and you can throw them away really quickly, because you didn't invest very much in them, in terms of effort and time. You, you invested like 10 years to get the skill to make it effortless, but that doesn't matter because you've got the skill now. There's lots of them. 
They're in a clear vocabulary that lets you know that this is a sketch and not a finished rendering. Um, and they're of no higher resolution than is necessary to communicate the idea. We'll come back to that one. And the main thing is they're ambiguous. And I'll come back to that one too because it's really important. The thing here when I talk about ambiguity and resolution is if you put too much detail in your rendering, you leave no room for the imagination. Right? Sketching and design at ideation is, about, is like Swiss cheese. There must be big enough holes for the imagination to expand and fit in and, and work with. And as soon as you put extra detail in, you give all kinds of opportunities to first of all divert attention but also to stifle imagination. The more ambiguous, the more you will learn, the better the conversation. We don't teach that very well, especially if we start going on to experience design because our tools are so bad that we can only afford to make one sketch, which means it's not a sketch. You, design isn't design if it's not about a, the exploration of multiple alternatives. If you don't have five viable answers for every question, you're probably not designing, you're engineering. And, but the other part here about ambiguity, and I'm going to contrast sketching with prototyping. And I'll just make a quick aside here. There is no such thing as a low fidelity prototype or a high fidelity prototype. Those are stupid terms that should be taken out of the literature. There is only one fidelity that should ever appear, and that is the correct fidelity. The right fidelity for the purpose. And when you're doing ideation, the whole purpose of sketching, and this is why you don't want resolution, is because it's to evoke, not to teach. It's to suggest, not to describe. It's to explore, not to refine. It's to question, not to answer. It's to propose, not to test. To provoke, not to resolve. It's tentative, rather specific, and it's non-committal versus it's, it's, it, it's non-committal rather than a depiction. And if we were to characterize the design process, it seems to me, it's to start here and go along this continuum and finish here. This isn't wrong. This is just wrong if it's here. This isn't wrong unless it's here in terms of the sequence, in terms of the ideas. And the question is, again, our process and how we teach this to make this work is, is, is fundamental. And as we've moved into this part where we've got digital software hardware working in on systems that are complex with large populations, we have huge challenges on how to do the first part, the ideation. Yet if we get the first part wrong, and this is the challenge, how on God's earth are the products the results going to be uh, achieving what they should or, or possibly could. And so there's a few things around here within sketching. Basically, it's not about the sketches. Sketches themselves are just artifacts. They're just objects. Sketches are simply a way to support design thinking, to support a process. And that process has, and so through their affordances of sketches, but they are part of a larger ecosystem that supports design thinking. And that's the part we've lost. The, my biggest complaint, and what I see at Microsoft or other places, is people think design is about the product. And they don't realize that the thing that distinguishes designers from other specialties is the process they take to thinking. It's not better than the process of an engineer. It's not better than the process of a lawyer. It's simply different. And unless you have all of the different processes of thinking working simultaneously to complement each other, you can have no confidence that you've got the best solution. So the one thing is, it's just things like sharing the ecosystem, so shared references. So things like foam boards and so on, where we can actually have inspirational material from the outside plus the sketches themselves, which you can annotate and so on. As soon as we start moving into temporal phenomena, videos don't go very well on a cork board or on foam board. Um, the ways to annotate, how to share. How do we keep shared references that are persistently on the wall so that we can have, that provoke conversations and provoke things with the types of media that we're working with in the future? We have really serious problems in the tools available for design that prejudice against design thinking. If you don't have those, you're not doing design. I'll be that dogmatic. The same thing is about the whole thing. Somebody asked me the other day what I mentioned uh, in the meeting on, on Wednesday about the importance of crit. And they said, well, what's crit? Crit is a short form English slang for criticism. 
but it's what, if you've taken a classic design education, it's what we learned to do from the very first day of art school or design school, and that is the students work, you put your work up on the wall, and everybody goes around and criticizes each other's work. When I say criticism, I don't mean negative, I mean you give informed commentary. And the purpose I'm, we, we want to get at here is just to say that this is a social thing. And the most important skill is that we learn how to give each other informed criticism so that we get criticized by our friends and colleagues in private rather than our enemies or competitors in public. And what I can say is there's two things about this that are really important to me. The number one thing around the purpose of crit is that, first of all, design is the only profession that does it, other than fine art. Engineers don't do it. They have no idea what you're talking about. It's one of the things that make things different. Sketching and the boards and so on are essential for the crit because you need multiple things. If I only do one design, you can't criticize the design without criticizing me. The reason you need to sketch and have multiples and have five things at least for every idea is that when I put up five things with no prejudice, then I haven't made up my mind, so I'm not going to criticize you for criticizing them because I haven't made a decision either. The minute I put one thing, I'm saying, I've decided this is the solution. You attack my solution, you attack me. You've broken down the entire social construct of the design process when you do that. And this is, again, how if we want design thinking to come into other organizations, the first thing we have to do is be conscious of how, what we do ourselves and what is distinct about our practice versus those of the people we're working with and try and have them understand how this works. And the critical thing about this is, is that I challenge you to find a single book on design education or on design practice or on design thinking that even mentions the word crit or criticism as a process which is fundamental to the design process. And the only thing when I was doing my own book about this that I could say was, I also found no books that talked about the importance of designers to breathe oxygen in order to stay alive. And the reason I didn't find anything about crit is because it's essentially as essential for the life of a designer as is breathing oxygen. So those, for the designer's perspective, there's no need to even talk about it any more than breathing because it's simply fundamental to the life but it's not fundamental to the uh, rest. So I'm going to just finish, so we have time for questions, with one simple example about, about how we might, um, about, I'll just give you one quick sketch. And, and, a, and, a, and a couple of quick things. The first is, this is some work from, uh, from Einhof, sort of from uh, Delft, which is just fantastic, storytelling. Remember, if you look in the dictionary, you'll see the word sketch works for theater and it works for writing, as well as it does for something you do on paper. And it's simple techniques. This is a sketching technique. Put a frame in front of somebody, and somebody who's too shy to do karaoke or too shy to act out, bingo, they'll start to perform because of, their, because of this TV. It's just something as simple and stupid as that. Other things, um, again, when I talk about the moral order, I took this photograph. This is the sociologist Richard Harper at Microsoft Research, Cambridge. For me, this is one of my favorite photos I ever took because here's my point. We're trying to design technologies for the home. And what I want to know is this, because I asked Richard to come into work when he was giving a talk at a meeting at the Microsoft Research Labs in his pajamas, and he did. That means he's like a designer. He's the right kind of person to work with. But here's what was fun about it. I wanted to make a point to capture it in a photograph about what's called the moral order of, of, the, of the home versus the office. Why is it okay to take a computer designed for the office and stick it in the home, even though it's perfectly appropriate for the office? Why is that any more legitimate or obvious then wearing your pajamas, which is perfectly legitimate at home when you're working, to not wear your pajamas at work. And my sense is it's just as questionable to put office technology in the home as it is to have your pajamas at the office. By taking that photograph, putting it there, you make a clear statement that will provoke conversation about the moral order. And for me, 
This is the type of reference material that changes the whole thing about design thinking, why it has to be on the wall. And so my one example of the sketching is just going to be my favorite example. This is the most important book. If you read this book, don't buy my book. Buy this one first. The Wizard of Oz. It's the most important thing. And here's The Wizard of Oz. The wizard's there. Dorothy, the Tin Man, the Scarecrow, and the Lion are all there to get freed, get their wishes granted by the wizard. Dorothy has a little dog called Toto. And Toto pulls back the screen and they see that the wizard is this little old man with a microphone and smoke pushing buttons to make everybody think that he was real. But the critical thing about this is this. As long as those folks believe the wizard is real, as long as Toto doesn't pull back the curtain, all of Dorothy's reactions are valid psychologically, sociologically, anthropologically, and emotionally. The wizard is real. And the trick about design is how to become a good wizard. The only way to engineer the future tomorrow and keep the ethics and values that I spoke about is if we have lived in it in the past. I'll say it again. The only way to engineer the future tomorrow is to have lived in it in the past. And the only way to do that is through the Wizard of Oz. It's not impossible. Sketching, ideation, means how do I find a way to live in the future before I've even designed it? And that's not a paradox. That's actually just the mystery that makes design such a great profession to be in. And with that, I will leave you, and I'm happy to take a few questions. Yeah, so here's, I mean, that, so the question is, is that especially if you're looking about issues of ethics and values, uh, where do you begin? How do you assert that? Because in some sense, it's almost, one of the things, especially the closer you go to Scandinavia is, the, the more the anti, the designer is God model, um, you, know, you know, because they want it to be participatory design and so on. So how do you deal with that dilemma? The reason I mentioned Kranzberg's law is this. If you're introducing anything into the culture, from a piece of paper, to a book, to an essay, to a product, you are lying to yourself if you don't realize you are already playing God. Okay? You are making a value judgment. So that's the dilemma. You either don't make anything or you acknowledge that you are making a value judgment, so where is that based? So the next thing comes down to, it seems to me, that within, if we're doing participatory design or ethnography or whatever you want to call it, then the challenge is, is sort of looking within the demographic or where you're, you're trying to introduce the culture, the society into which you're introducing the product, and maybe trying to see, first of all, what are the values is the first step. You see, I, I, put, I, I know it's a, it's a provocative question, but it's, and I'm not even going to answer it, but at least as long as you provoke the question, I don't care if we have the answer, I just care that we try to find the answer, and it's on our mind. But at least then, I, when I'm doing my probes or ethnography, I, I'm going to start trying to get a sense of, first of all, what values do I see reflected in that culture, what are unique about it, but also what are the aspirations. I think a couple things that are really fascinating. Here's what I study. I think here's what I'd like to see studied uh, in, 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 in design school. I'd like to study what is it and I don't know if in Dutch the same thing happened, but in English, we made a transition in the last 20 years from sexist language to gender neutral language. There was no law, but culturally we made a decision to change. In Holland, from when I lived here in the 70s to now, smoking, 
there's some change. Um, drinking and driving, picking up after your dog, there's a number. What we do as designers, we're collectors. I think some of the things we should be collecting to try and understand these issues are, first of all, what are the dynamics of change? I would say right now the green approach has, is changing. But, but also, what are the mechanisms whereby those changes can be brought about through design? The women's movement, for example, had a lot to do with the change of gender-neutral language. What did they do that we could learn from as a design technique if we are, in fact, trying to bring about change, where design could be a proactive tool to make positive change, whether it's in the marketplace or in the culture, uh, in which, which level of culture? It's a hard question, but I, I think we have to be asking it, or we deserve what we get. Yes? Yeah. So the, the question, in case you didn't hear it, has to do with, it's probably easy to get a sense of what I'm talking about as long as we think about traditional physical products. As we move more and more into the digital domain, such as, for example, things that are purely digital, think about uh, blogging or, you know, if, uh, how do you start to manage that? And I think the Or, or things within smart homes, or intelligence within cars, uh, smart cars and so on. Not, not the, what, what I'd say about that is this. Be very, very clear. Things that are digital, their existence and creation is dominated by people primarily in software engineering. And what is critical to understand is the software engineering and the software world is completely illiterate about design. There is nothing that even resembles the design process in how software is done. And furthermore, the software world, which we so depend on, has a zero track record of creating new products. There's not a software company in the world that has grown by making new products themselves. They have failed completely, every company. And the only way the software industry has grown is by acquiring little companies that, that succeeded. Adobe in its entire history has done two new products in-house. Microsoft has done more, but it's a bigger company. Macromedia did three. So the first thing is, we depend on software. There is no design in software. But software people can deal with the temporal things. They know how to program. They have skills that are essential to help the design of the products going forward. People from the design professions have very little software skills, but they have great design. Alone, neither can deal with the problems we're dealing with. Together, if they understand each other's strengths and weaknesses, you start to have something that might be able to answer the question you're asking. And again, I'm not going to be presumptuous and try and answer the question. I'm going to tell you how I want to approach answering it myself, because I have the same question. That's my job. And it is basically to say, we have these different disciplines. You need to be very deep to have the software skills or the design skills. And if you're deep in this one, you don't have time to be deep in that one, so you need a partnership. So it's what I would call a heterogeneous social network, um, but in the, that's the expensive term. The cheap term is the Renaissance team. You know, you can't have Renaissance. We began in sketching in the Renaissance, and now I want to start a new Renaissance, but not the Renaissance of Renaissance man or woman, but the Renaissance team. And, and that's the part that then, if you're going to have a team, Recognize it doesn't matter if you have the best goalie, goalkeeper from every football team in Europe, you will lose even playing amateurs because you need to have the full complement of skills for the team that you want. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.
Yes, yes of course. For another year. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to listen. Next one's, oh, I hear myself. That was great, wasn't it? I'm sure the next ones will be great as well. The next speaker is two speakers, uh, two of my colleagues, two of my long-time colleagues, I must say, Caroline Hummels and Stefan Wensvin, and they're going to talk about ripples or something. The floor is yours. Yes, we're going to talk about ripples, and we're going to show a few. The ripples echo the reflection. And when Case asked us to speak at this symposium, he asked us to talk about the education. And that's what we're going to do. So the background of this talk, yes, we are going to present something about the education of industrial design here in Eindhoven. But if you want to know what the education is about, I suggest you read the accreditation report because it nicely documents all the things we've done in the past and the things we're going to do in the future. So we wanted to do something more and we want to show our reflection on the education at industrial design. But who are we? This is Caroline. Uh, maybe can, I can introduce myself shortly for those who do not know me. I have a background, um, a couple of years School of the Arts, then went on to Industrial Design Engineering, did both my Masters and my PhD at the Delft University of Technology, and started working there in 1993 um, with, uh, with Case. Um, in 2004, I did a lot of freelance work on, on, on the site, but in 2004 I, I set up a small company also in addition to, uh, to my work at the university um, called IDEDOC and uh, luckily I changed for me, luckily, maybe for the team, but um, in December, last December I moved over to Eindhoven. I'm very happy that I can join now this faculty and build on uh, the group design and quality interaction and if you would kind of say what kind of a designer I am you could kind of say that I'm two things I'm a designer researcher and I very much focus on research through design and I always like to build stuff and get people experience um, and the second thing is um, I, I really really love education um, but I always like to do it in a hands-on way so you could label me like doing things through experience. This is me, born, raised and educated in Delft. Um, it's good to see a lot of people from Delft here. Um, industrial design engineering also at the technical <coughs> university there. And I also did my PhD with an actual design as a carrier for the research, doing research through design. And I'm also known as the alarm clock guy. Looking back, I counted 10 years of teaching experience, five in Delft, and now five years in Eindhoven. So I know a bit of the differences and the similarities. I'm also currently leader, project leader for the DSearch labs, and I will explain a bit more about it in this presentation. Something about the history of this department, founded in 2001, it's six years ago, and it was a result of four discussions with the industries around Eindhoven. Of course, Philips, um, OC. There was also participation of the Design Academy. And the industry wanted to have a new type of design engineer, um, a new focus for the department, a new direction. And we wanted, or they wanted, or we'll, a new type of designer and a new educational system to educate this designer. 
A few facts as some sort of background. Um, founded in 2001, approximately 500 students, 25% female, 150 students, a lot of PhD students, um, many nationalities, and also people from outside the department as freelancers influencing our education, which is a good thing. And also, the language is in English. As a reflection, as we want to reflect, or um, our department as a reflection of the real world, you can wonder if this is the proper reflection. Something about the focus. Um, the official focus is, I think, intelligent systems, products, and related services. But these intelligent systems are not without people. Although the picture doesn't show any people, I think the focus should be including these pe people in these systems, maybe in the interaction with the products and in the related services. They also wanted new types of technology, high technology, but also in a humanistic way, a humanizing technology. And because this technology is so complex and it needs to be put into the world, there are different fields that are responsible for putting this into the world. Electronics, uh, programming, software, the marketing side of things, ergonomics, usability. So the new type of designer need to know about these different fields, not be an expert in it, but need to communicate with these other experts and creating opportunities for innovations. How do we want to achieve this? How do we want to educate this new type of designer? We chose that the department and the education should in somehow reflect the real world. Integrate these different fields that are responsible for products into this real world. And a competency-centered learning system, reflection on action, and the creation of some personal identity for these students. So the education should be a reflection of industrial design, a reflection of a university of technology, and a reflection of the real world, or maybe vice versa. What does it mean, reflecting the real world? What do we see? The department should offer these opportunities of reflection. So industrial design, the department, operates in a rich world of all these different influences, all these different ripples reflecting on each other. It's a diversity of expertises, diversity of people, diversity of interests, background, a diversity in design challenges, and there's a need to integrate all these different fields, to be aware of these different fields. So, the department, the education, should provide a rich learning environment. And part of the real world is also that we treat our students as junior employees. At the start of the department, it wasn't very big. There were a few expertises, different people, and we all needed to work together to educate the students. And because we were so small and we need to build, we had to work together. And you knew about each other's expertise. You knew what students were good at and Slowly we were growing, and at this moment, maybe we're getting so big and so many new people coming in that we lose sight of what other people's expertises are. We are aware of our own expertise and the, one, the people who have similar expertise, but what about these other people? A lot of new people come in and sometimes forget that this diversity is, I think, one of the strengths the major strengths of our department of the education. And 
Therefore, we need to constantly cooperate with each other, know about each other's expertise, trust that others can contribute to this education within their own expertise, respect it, and we don't want that each coach is um, a department in itself, that we know that we all need to acquire all the expertise to coach our students. Now we need to trust that we can guide students to other people, other expertises, and learn from them and together build on good projects. One thing to resemble the real world is not treat students as students, but as junior employees. They are responsible too for building this department. They are responsible for building their own education together with us. This asks for responsibility from students, from these junior employees. It also requires trust from us. We need to trust our students that they do well and give them the confidence that they can do well and design beautiful things. But we need to do it together. Um, sometimes I know coaches who say, let them make those mistakes, they will learn from it. I would say, well, prevent them from making those mistakes and try to achieve a higher level and let them make the mistakes there on that higher level because in that way we all learn from it. Another way to resemble the real world is having real clients. Not fictive projects with imaginary clients, but real clients with problems coming from the real world, the complexity of the real world. It also teaches students some responsibility. They are responsible for their clients. They have to earn their money and somehow make these clients feel that their design challenge is in good hands with those students. It also shows students the business side of things, which is something that has been lacking for the five, past five years, past six years. So it's good to see that we now have a capacity group called Business Design Processes, Business Process Design, sorry, next to um, Designed Intelligence, the technology side of thing, things, User-Centered Engineering, the user side of things, and Designing Quality Interaction. As an example of um, how the real world reflects our education and the other way around is the design practice of Little Mountain, a cooperative of several different students from industrial design who after their bachelor went out and created their own little environment of different expertises. So they're sitting in his office with all different types of people, different projects, and working together to create interesting projects. The real world also implies real user, not a polished persona for marketing, not a fictive user group, but real people in real settings. Inspiring users. Create some empathy with the people you design for, understand them, understand their dreams, and in that way, create real value. Education doesn't operate on its own. It's part of the department, it's part of the university, and therefore, we need also research. And in the, the accreditation committee, labeled our education as research-inspired design education. I think in a way it evolved naturally. Um, the people who were here from the start, the permanent staff, all had a history in, in research. And in that way they contributed and introduced their research agendas into the education. Also when we talk about the future of innovation, we need research to inspire and inform innovation and we need research through design. What we did is to try to uh, get through those uh, research-inspired education is setting up the research labs. Last year at the same place we introduced it. And what we try to do there is also reflect the real world. So try to build 
little worlds inside the department. I mean, this is not the real world, but it gives a better uh, view for students if they sit inside the real setting and try to design or demonstrate or evaluate their products. We also wanted to give them the proper tools, proper tools they will be using in their future life when they enter the real world. We want research that inspires education. In this case, a light designed by Ralph Zoontjes, where Philip Ross's research project was used as inspiration. But it's also the other way around, where education inspires research. This is a project, FIDA, done for Microsoft Research, by Mehmet Jelvac and John Helms. And it never, there was not really a research question behind it when it was designed, but as soon as it emerged, it inspires researchers to actually use it in a larger context. How do people appropriate this design? Something more about the education from Caroline. Maybe some of the things that you heard are not new. And for me, when I came over in, in, in December over here, I was really, really intrigued by the educational system that is um, kind of taught in this department. It has a beautiful combination, at least in my eyes, it's beautiful, of three um, assets. It's competency-centered learning, it's reflection on action, and how to create a personal identity. And I would like to address those three topics shortly. Starting with the competency-centered learning. So, the whole education model is, is based on this competency learning model. And what, what is it? So if you look at the definition of a competency, that's an individual's ability to select, acquire and use the knowledge, skills and attitudes that are required for effective behavior in a specific professional, social or learning context. For me, what makes it extremely interesting as a designer is that you integrate the skills, the knowledge and the attitudes and that you make it context dependent. So it's not the same in every situation, it's a kind of holistic approach. And that makes it really powerful and beautiful. So what we do within a department is we train them, you can see that the competencies are on different levels. We have these six core competencies that reflect the fields or the domains of industrial design. And we have four meta competencies, which you could say is somehow um, focus more on the fundamentals of developing this academic level. Of course, it's not about the competencies as such. It's about the integration of it all. And what we then want to do and want to learn these students, and that's why I really love Bill's talk, is it's about the experience. It's about how you deal with it. It's not about designing the products as such. It's about how you integrate this. And what, what we teach these students is they have to learn by doing. It's the way that they approach it. They have to experience themselves what it's all about. Go on your mountain bike, experience what it is. Um, and then that design experience, what they all focus on, that's their starting point about creating knowledge and about getting their theoretical concepts. You could, I had a lot of discussions in the past about can you ask this from freshmen? They come in, can you immediately ask of them to design something? What they do up here is they actually let the first years immediately work on real-world problems. We have real clients and they are the junior employee. That, is, that gives a lot of responsibility, but it is also beautiful that they can jump and they can learn in that way. But of course, they're not trained designers yet. So you have these three steps. First, what we like to do is work on awareness building. Get them the awareness. What is industrial design? What is it all about? What we have to do? Who are the players? What are users? What's the process? What we have to deal with? So get all these bits and pieces together and awareness about this whole world that we're dealing with. 
Then from that point on in the second year, develop themselves, go into the depth. What is it that they're trying to do? So develop their skills, develop their competencies. Look at the entire breadth of the, of the whole field. And then in the third year, if they have grips, they know what it is about, then they can start even develop themselves more. What is it that I personally, as an industrial designer, want to achieve? And for me, what's really beautiful, that in the end, you have a whole lot of bachelor students, you have a whole lot of master students, and no one is the same. So if you look at this, and if you want to train them, and you want those levels that ask for a certain design process, and I think that could be something that we even need to sharpen and attune in the future. So this would be uh, basically our, our approach, I think, what we would suggest is you have on these two sides, you have to deal as a designer with both your senses, the sensitivity to what you, uh, what you make and what you do. So like the, the, for instance, the sketching skills, you have to get attuned, you have to perceive, you have to see what's in there in the world, you have to connect, empathize with the user. And on the other hand, you have to reflect, you have to think on what you're doing, you have to abstract. You have to know all kinds of things. Be critical. And try to combine these two worlds into one and integrate that into, a, I would say, not the product as such, but the interaction and the experience, or as what's stated in the mission statement, the interaction is the function of the user, the system, in a certain context. So play in this entire field. But, it's not about only making a product, designing the interaction, getting the experience right, whatever that may be, because your experience will be probably different than yours and yours. I know that Case is still nervous, so he will experience this day completely different than we will. At least I assume. Um, so that means that you need a clear vision. What do I want to bring to the world? What is it about these values? What is the value system of a user? What is your value system? And what do you like to bring in the world? That's often been said in the past that design is about solving problems. And as Bill already indicated also in this week, during this week, it's, it's not about solving problems. So what was said very often, maybe we should change it to finding problems, setting problems. I like that notion, but on the other hand, for me, it still has a negative connotation. Because the word problems immediately kind of suggests that there is something wrong which you need to fix. I think that we would like to propose that it's far more from the positive side. If you're thinking about innovations, the setting and the finding is important, but we would like to set it as creating opportunities. Creating opportunities for people to experience transform their world, make something really powerful for people that, transform, that transforms their world, that gives them new opportunities to do things, to experience things, to interact with people, to interact with the world. So, how do we know if it's okay? Validate. What is quality? Quality is not something on paper, it's like, ah, oh, I think it's good. Quality is in the world. Quality is when it actually plops down like our drop and says, okay, yes, I see that it resonates with the people outside. They are happy. They can experience themselves. So that's why we think we have to have this whole picture in that design process. And then you say, okay, this is a design process. Well, we need something in addition. I think there are four different topics that students have to be trained in and that can help them. They have to communicate. They have to communicate with others and they have to communicate internally. Sketching is one way of communi communicating with yourself, also communicating with others. But in this entire process, communication is a really, really important issue. And then you have the tools and methods to do that, to bring your design process along, to get these things. Sketching might be one, video might be one, and I think things that we are now exploring is 
What can you do with these dynamic, highly dynamic systems? What kind of tools do you need? How can you capture the experience? How can you capture the interaction? And even worse, how can you capture an experience with an intelligent system that changes every second and is context dependent? Extremely hard to do, but very fascinating to see how we can solve that one. The process and the phases, what do we know about that? And we can even support students. And then in the end, if they go through the cycle several times, they will develop their identity. And that's one of the importance of this whole faculty, I, I believe. So if you look at the traditional design process, if there is one, then you see that's a fairly stru structured way of doing it. You analyze. You look into the literature, you are very much on the knowing side, you set your requirements, you try to integrate that into a product, and then you test it. I don't believe that that's the way that we should go, maybe for some projects, maybe for some people, but within this department, where the competency-based, focusing on experience, getting this whole identity thing, we need to step from these several points to another point. And we need to make the students aware that these are different transitions and they very much have to go from one state to another. And what's the most important, they have to reflect in between. And that's basically the second topic. So when you step, for instance, from sensing and perceiving, you have to step back for a while and reflect on what you were doing. So if you then look at Donald Schoen, like reflection in action or reflection on action, the beauty that I see within this statement is that it both helps you to understand the phenomena, but it helps you also in making new decisions. So it guides you where you want to go. Okay, and that's also the, the, the way that we evaluate students. They do it through self-evaluation. So let me give you one example of Bas Grunendal. He's our first uh, master student. He graduated, or he got his diploma just a week ago. And I think we're very proud, proud that we have our first seven students who graduated from the master track. And he developed Scope. And Scope is a photo camera for children in former war zones. And to help them to cope with their past. And if you look at bus project, you can say, okay, at certain starting points, it was about war child, it was about so, um, uh, psychosocial care, and phototherapy. Therapy. And he looked into the literature a bit, but what I very much liked that he did, um, and that very much beautifully fits in the first talk, I think, it's about sketching to create these opportunities. Bas, fairly in the beginning of his process, started making things, started experiencing himself. So what is it? What can I do? What, what, does, what does taking photographs mean? And he came up with these ideas like sharing things, looking from another perspective, seeing yourself and reflecting on yourself. And always through sketching, through 3D sketches, through renderings, through getting this whole notion about what is it all about. Uh, and that helped him to set his focus, that helped him to say it, it's about framing and looking at the world and it's about looking at yourself. And the beautiful thing is about the, the, the design students that are trained up here, they can actually build stuff. It's amazing what they can do, at least in my eyes it's amazing what they can do. But they can make a prototype, give it to use and I'll let them try to experience what they made. And that's what the importance is about building prototypes, that you can actually set it out in the world and people can interact with it and, and explore the experience. So what he did with his first prototype, he gave it to children and let them respond on it, make photographs. And what the beauty is that will be very hard to do with sketches um, is that they could actually interact with it. And he could look at the interaction of the prototype. He could look at the behavior of the children. He could look at the, the behavior between the kids and how that socially was done, which is extremely hard if you don't have something that works and is on this experiential level. And he used that to work on, and then he built his second prototype. 
So you can see, you stop over here, but you can see that you can take that process on and you can use a third and a fourth prototype for fine tuning. So in our opinion, making models, making prototypes is extremely important for this whole development of intelligent systems and products and related services. Um, but what we do must remember, and that's maybe a reflection on our side, it's not the prototype as such that's important. It becomes important when you connect it to, the, to your vision and you connect it to the validation. And the three of them, that's real strength. So it's not the prototype as such is the end goal, but it does something to help you experience and to validate that. So that brings us to the last one of this is to create a personal identity. If you look at that, what we try to train the students is to have to work on their attitudes. It's about passion and flexibility, social relationships. As Stephen already mentioned, it's about responsibility and trust. It's about self-development and it's about setting your focus. What is your vision? What do you want to do? I'm just going to give you three examples, two of, of the graduate students that just uh, had their uh, master diploma in uh, last week, who finished. Uh, Rick is one of them. And what the nice thing is, because you have this awareness, depth and identity, that over these years they actually create their own personality and, they, and you can see from them the signs who they are. This is Rick. I could show you a photo of Rick, but I think it's far more interesting to see what he designs. And you can see that he's very much in the interactivity, the playfulness and the physical active interactions. Ruth Lemons, also graduated. Ruth is a completely different person. The way that you talk, the way that he behaves, the way that he designs, and also his subjects. The things that he designs, beautifully designed, but completely different than the things that Rick did. He is very much about traffic and public safety design. Someone who likes to finish very shortly, in a couple of months, uh, is John Helmers. I always saw his figure uh, over there, but he is, again, another type of designer. He's very much on the personal, intimate and tangible interaction. And I think what the nice thing is, that he is, it's not only about the content, but also the way that they work. John is typically someone that builds prototype right from the start. And through building these prototypes, through building beautifully working 3D sketches, he knows where he has to go and he knows and he explores kind of the, the kind of things that he likes to design. So what is our then reflection on the identity of industrial design itself? Who are we as a department? I think we are somewhere, well, we've passed the awareness. We know a bit where we are, what we are. What, what the world is all about. Um, we know a bit about the depth, but we certainly don't have our identity set yet. We have to develop that. I think we're doing a great job. The attitude, perfect. I really love working here and hope the rest will do. But I think because it's a fresh, you know, a fresh department, people are really, really eager to work and to get somewhere together. So the responsibility and the trust is very important, as Stefan already said. We have to develop, so we have to do stuff, not only talk on paper. I know we do it, but I would say do it more. Let's build together things, let's make together things and evaluate it. And last, have a clear focus and vision. And I'm sure Case will say something about that later on. A beautiful vision. Some more of our uh, reflections. Um, already said something about business processes introduced. Students have, well, experienced business through the real clients, but it needs to be more substantiated also with assignments and modules and experts within the department who know something about doing business. We also would like to see the research labs expand an arena to work together to have more projects, larger projects, where we need each other's expertise to get these projects off the ground. This entails then a cooperation between each other within the department and also to the outside, to external partners 
and in this way we can develop our own identity. <coughs> this is a cheeky one. Um, does our hierarchical model resemble our educational model? Does it resemble the real world? We also need to work on the visibility of the department. We all think we're really good, but does the outside world know? Maybe slowly they do. And with our new master students, we get a better view, have better visibility, but we need to work on that. I really like the system, our educational system. It's a difficult system, it requires hard work, a lot of flexibility from all people involved. And sometimes we see that bureaucracy creeps in, efficiency, efficiency is valued over flexibility, and this is a risk we run. And we should be aware that we keep the model as it is. I think I can add on to this one. Is well, you might have noticed that we really love design and we really love this for the department. But I think we have, and I'm sure at four o'clock you will get the full view on that. But clang, sorry. Everybody's awake again. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not used to it. I hope it sticks on at least till the end. It's just two minutes. Bear with me. Um, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> okay, we love design. But um, what I would like to see more is, as designers, we can do something for that world. We can do something in different fields. We can do something for users, focus on the experience, give them the power to transform themselves, give them the power to give really meaning to this world. But it's something else that we should do. At least, that's certainly our opinion. We should do something in this university. We should do something in this kind of academic world. Design is often seen as this kind of weird thingy, what is it doing here inside a technical university? It's seen as kind of a bit odd. But I think design is something beautiful to bring. And you hear more and more research, it's also in different departments that talk about the value of design and think we can show them something. And if we have the primacy of design, and if we can show them the strength of this educational model, the beauty of how we deal with things, then it's not only like we are the little ones that have to ignore, but it's also that we can bring something to the others. And then the last, I would say, we're doing it, but we have to keep on doing it. Practice what we preach. It's all about reflection. It's all about getting in depth. It's all about this beauty of identity. And I think that would be beautiful if we can even fine tune this. And I think that brings us to the end of our talk. Thank you very much. I now have the honor to introduce our next speaker, and he flew in specially for this occasion from Japan. It's uh, Professor <laughs> Professor Yamanaka from the University of Tsukuba in Japan, and uh, he's going to talk about Kansai research for design. The floor is yours. Yes. It's, it's okay. Uh, you hear me? Uh, it is a great pleasure, and uh, it's my honor to be uh, have this kind of chance to talk about my uh, school. Today, I prepared my topic, the cancer science for slightly changed the design process. 
My name is Yamanaka, and I'm from Japan. Now we used to use the, some, the, the kanji characters, Japanese. Now today I prepared uh, four different talks. And uh, since you know, the <coughs> limited time, I will, I will introduce you know, very fastly the, some topics. The first three, now I will introduce my school. It's uh, geographically in this location. It's at the part of, uh, east part of Japan. And from Tokyo, the one hour uh, drive uh, from Tokyo, north to, uh, to Tokyo. And there is the, the city, the, uh, the Tsukuba city. This is the kind of artificial city, now concentrated the lots of the uh, national institute of research uh, concentrated in. The, so the, the among the, the uh, national research facilities, the school is located in. And we recently, you know, uh, five years, six years ago, we built a, the new uh, research building. It's, uh, among this, uh, in this building, we have the three different interdisciplinary research uh, group. Now, among that, you know, our group, the Kansei uh, Behavioral and Brain Sciences, is in this uh, building, like this. No, it's still, uh, it's so far a very small research group. And the, before talking about the, the, the cancer research, I was uh, talking a little bit about the educa education in University of Tsukuba. It's uh, considered with the, the four years of the undergraduate system, the School of Art and Design. It includes the arts and the constructive arts, that is the kind of the, the very basic uh, artwork, uh, basic uh, design, and the design. Now, including the architecture, environmental, product design, information design, all together in one single uh, the education system. That means you know, the students can uh, learn, learn about the painting and the criticizing the painting and the design all together in, the, in one school. Uh, so the students are, you know, can have a kind of diversity of the disciplines. And the, on top of this school, we have the two different the graduate schools, the master's and uh, doctorate program in art and design. Uh, in this system, uh, we have the, the variation of the design, uh, the master and doctoral level of education. And at this parallel, now we have the master's and doctoral program in Kansei, behavioral and brain sciences. It's consists with Kansei information science. Uh, no, I will, I will uh, talk about the Kansei later on and comparative cognitive science, behavioral neurosciences, and neurosciences, that's so-called you know, brain science, and neuroinformatics. Now, all together, you know, the, the, most of them are the, the very you know, scientific and uh, human scientific the researches, uh, all together. And beside that, there are the small part of you know, sports science, coaching study, you no. Know, the, this, all together, we named it Graduate School of the Comprehensive Human Sciences. That means they're related to the all human activity in one single graduate school. And we are working in connection between those schools. So the, now, <coughs> this is the kind of not, not written in here, but you know, now we are start talking with the really working together with the sports people and the, the medical people with a single no task, no single the, uh, research that, uh, group uh, promoting a, the, the relationship between the body and the mind. What is the, the relation between the body and the mind? That is a really no, no big topic of the, the future research. And the, talking back to the uh, undergraduate school, now we have the, this, a, the website, and we have in this, uh, in undergraduate research, uh, this, uh, education, we have the four different categories, but uh, all together with the, we have the, we try to educate the designers, which have the, the all you know, the architecture knowledge and skill, and the information design skill all together. You know. So those are the, the sum of the achievement of the undergraduate schools, you know, information design, and the architecture, and uh, it's too rapid. The last, uh, this is the, the one of the 
the achievements are done by my students, uh, the Agato Nagata. He is now working at the Okamura Corporation. Uh, it's an office company, office, uh, office furniture company. This is the furniture. He made the 1.5 centimeter thick furniture and stand up like this way. And to uh, making this, you know, he's, uh, he's, he wants to hide the mechanism as much as possible so that we spend a lot of time to make you know, the hinges you know, to connect the, the five millimeter thickness the, uh, paper, you know, it's a board, cardboard, to connect it together with and hide it, the hinges and put it in the 1.5 centimeter thick. It's a really, really hard work. You know, it, we spent uh, two months for the, making these kind of <laughs> hinges. And uh, it's awarded uh, by the, the uh, undergraduate schools. And among the master project, this is the strange achievement of the, uh, the master project. The, the, the guy uh, is now working in the Toyota Motor Company, They're working for the Lexus design. But the, in the masters, the, he developed a mobility. He, he is uh, studying on the mobility. And what is the mobility? The, the core, the, the concept of the mobility is to try, want to uh, go to anywhere where, uh, when they want. How to reflect their want? You know, that go to going, want to go into somewhere, the people will move a little bit. Then the, uh, this machine uh, with the, the uh, complex links, uh, it's enhance the small mo motion and the move the, system, the whole system to, uh, where they, he want to go. Of course, this machine cannot move up, no climb up, because you know, it, without the engines. But the, in the, the flat surface, you know, this machine is you know, really smoothly uh, bring people to the, the where he want. And this is another uh, very kind of basic uh, the research topic. It's a, a video ethnographic system, and uh, to analyzing the interfaces, <coughs> uh, the uh, recorded interface, or the kind of, this is the example of the uh, teaching experience, and uh, cut off the the, uh, the scenes and categorize it. Automatically, it provides a, the structurizing the the, the movements, the, so that we can know that what is going on and what is the the cause of the the action and what is the the result of the action. So this is the. Uh, we use some uh, in some uh, the research later on, and uh, those are the uh, education uh, the uh, designs art and design school. And uh, in 2001, we started the different education uh, uh, doctoral education program, Kansei Behavioral and Brain Sciences. Now, uh, this is the uh, this. Uh, WW Kansei Tsukuba ACJP. And in this doctoral program, we, had a, we grabbed a national project from the uh, Japanese government. It's uh, a half a billion yen in total of the five years. And uh, the, uh, this is the promotion of the, the Kansei science. No, it's so called Kansei science. Uh, it's, prom it's, it's promoting the scientific research. Uh, for the for understanding the mind, and to understanding the mind, we are uh, we are we are work together with the uh, medicine medicine or medical uh, researches, psycho uh, psychosomatic researches, psychology and art and design all together working with uh, together with. But uh, this is a kind of example, you know, this is the kind of measuring what is going on. Uh, we want to detect the phenomenon or the kind of sign uh, of the, the human natural motion. Now this is the, the recording system of the, the humans, the action, the uh, head action, the, the direction of the head and the size of the head, uh, the, where, where, uh, asking him to work on the, some design task. And with this, uh, this kind of physiological measurement, um, it is really difficult to 
measure this kind of the real world. No? All the time, the scientific approach is making a model, making a simplifying the, the problem and making a model and applying the model for the experiment and measure it, then they, they can find a, some sort of the evidence. That is the approach of the science. But as a designer, we do want to measure a kind of real world. So it's become suddenly you know, very difficult. Now, in this case, we had a, uh, this, the kind of the color arrangement task. But this color arrangement task, there are lots of the, uh, the factors. So that we only want uh, the finding of this experiment is that when the person is really concentrated to the, the work, the, per the person's face becomes bigger. No? <laughs> what does this mean? That means the people tend to go closer, come closer, come closer to the, the screen when he is the very kind of, kind of uh, concentrated to the, to the job. What, I, what it, uh, they found is the, the, on top of this subject, there is a you know, headset. It measures the you know, brain waves. And uh, uh, calculating the brain waves, we found you know, the, whether this person is concentrated to or the, the kind of boring or something. Another <coughs> research topic to, to just that what is going on? Can, can, I, can we measure the, the mind status of the admiring the art? It's also very difficult. <laughs> now, no, the regular the scientists, no, sci uh, psychological scientists, they are always laughing to this kind of the, uh, the model, experimental model. It's stupid. No, no can, nobody can measure this kind of situation. But yeah, OK, we, using those kind of the, uh, the physiological measurement, we may find something. That is the, the kind of starting point of this experiment. And uh, we check the heart rate and uh, analyze the heart rate. But in this case, no, I fo we found the heart rate is really difficult to measure a rapid movement of the mind. The heart rate changes very slowly. So that we now stopped using this, uh, the heart rate, but now we are using uh, the, the eye movement, eye movement and uh, the, the changing of the pupil size. Now it's really nice. And uh, this is the, uh, the most recent research. Uh, possibly, you know, the next week we will continue this uh, research in here. Uh, it's uh, really an uh, analyzing the, uh, <coughs> using the uh, repertory grid method. It's, uh, the we are also uh, using the repertory grid method, but you know, no, in this summer we uh, had a, a nice uh, cooperative work within the the Mr. Tomiko, the here, uh, we start the working together, the sharing our knowledge and the combining together and uh, try to, to know uh, what is uh, the evaluation of the, the ballpoint pens. These are the ongoing, but uh, the, I will introduce a little more about, you know, more interesting the research result, but before that, I would like to uh, explain design process and the Kansei. The Kansei is the keyword of our research. Is the, since I'm the, the uh, really designer, the, uh, design background, so I always study with the uh, introduction of the, the uh, design process. This is the uh, old style you know, structural planning uh, introduced by the Charles Owen in uh, TU Delft. Uh, no, 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 uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. <laughs> Uh, all, uh, already, you know, almost 20 years ago. <coughs> I, I were in, uh, you know, Institute of Technology. And the, according to him, design process must have a think process and understand the phase, the working top down and the bottom up and uh, with understanding. <coughs> uh, in this process, <coughs> sorry, uh, he always, asking the designer to write down, the explain things and everything, write down. So that <coughs> there have to be a question. Can we process with the explicit knowledge? Not enough. That's because we know more than we can describe. <coughs> <coughs> so 
sorry. I uh, okay. uh, the tunnel uses a intuitive understanding process. We name this process, this kind of the intuitive understanding process, as a concept in Japanese. So this is the, the uh, Japanese letter. It's uh, Japanese or Taiwanese or chi uh, Chinese uh, in East Asian letter. Kansei is the sensitive uh, cognition as a fundamental, uh, no, <coughs> it's similar to the uh, sensitive cognition as a fundamental of thinking. It's the uh, ability of the uh, prescriptive intuition and comprehension. Kansei is the fundamental ability for the designer's creativity we, we, we would think. I'm hearing at the, the previous uh, presentation, competency is a sort of the kind of similar uh, point. Thank you. So the always know uh, we have to have uh, the definition before the defining the concept. Uh, I will describe the how we use. It. Uh, there is a concept process. It uh, gathers the fun uh, functions related to emotion, sensitivity, and feelings, experience, intuition. For example, sensory uh, qualified uh, related functions and including the interaction between them. <coughs> and a concept means, a concept have a means uh, the all senses, uh, sight, hearing, taste, those senses, and probably the other uh, internal factors. The result of the Kansai is the fruit of the Kansai process. It appears to be a, <coughs> uh, I'm very sorry, uh, I got a, the very bad code. Uh, it appears to be a unified in the perception providing a qualitative meaning and value of one uh, direct environment. In other words, the Kansai result is how one perceives the, the qualitative one's environment. This is the kind of description of the, the nature of the cancer. We are now, now start using this diagram now for the uh, try to locating the what we are researching on. The in the center part, the, that is the mental process in the in the brain, and uh, it's surrounded by the many uh, different kind of phenomenon or behavior all together. But all everything is linked. That, is, that makes it difficult to, uh, for the, the research. And uh, this is the usage of the, the, the term Kansai. We frequently use, uh, usually use the your Kansai, and uh, the, uh, he or she had King Kansai. The Kansai is good, expression in the panda in Kansai. That, is, that, uh, that shows you know, the, uh, what we use the, this term for. It's uh, some part of it that looks like you know, the, the value or looks like a, the kind of the na a noun or, yeah, it's, uh, it's of course it's noun, but they always uh, the cons to, uh, talking of, about the uh, concept, we have to know, I uh, have to start with the, the knowledge. The, the knowledge, the roughly, you know, uh, categorizing the knowledge into two, we can uh, categorize in uh, the descriptive knowledge and tacit knowledge. And what is the relation in between? Then the, we are now putting the, the term concept in, uh, in between the tacit knowledge and descriptive knowledge. Intuitive perception requires a process between the descriptive knowledge and tacit knowledge. The transformation makes a process of the concept. Then the designer uses this, the concept process for the uh, expression. The use the implicit knowledge directly transferred to the uh, transformed into the expression or information conceptualization, and of course we uh, the people will use descriptive knowledge and uh, explain it and understand it uh, from the uh, expression 
No, that is also the process, but the, mostly we, are, we assume the concept is the process of the intuitive side. And the, for the designers, <coughs> we, I uh, tend to say you know, that design is mostly using this uh, tacit or implicit uh, level of the knowledge uh, directly to the products. And uh, still, you know, this process is unknown. But the, uh, this is the uh, kind of the definition and the relationship between design and Kansei. And this is the very a new diagram I prepared for this today. No. Uh, using the tacit knowledge and descriptive knowledge. Now, it's a, this is the diagram for the communication. Kansei research a vision in the communication. And uh, using the, uh, the tacit and descriptive knowledge both together, and <coughs> evoke the metaphor. Now we those the knowledge will evoke a kind of metaphor, and express the, the convert it to the expression or action, and the using the interface, and there is a mechanism or the information system, and a mechanical effect is occurred. This affect to the environment or community, and the, the other side, the relation, uh, re reaction by mechanism will cause the, the uh, pass through the me uh, mechanism or information system, and through the interface, then the perception or understanding will occur with the, the evoked metaphor, and then the, the other person will get a knowledge kind. Uh, the evoked metaphor is a kind of important, different, uh, important part in, in this diagram. Now, evoked metaphor is the personal experience. Now, the, we are now using the evoked metaphor as a name for the understanding. Understanding is just the evoked metaphor. This is the, the recently we are the defining, uh, the giving the name for. Now, understanding is just evoked metaphor. Because metaphor is a personal thing, no? F formed with the personal experience. It's evoked by a stimulus. That means the understanding is not the transfer of the information. That is the, it's, it's a radical, but the, it's a definition. Then, if the interface becomes personalizing, what is it going on? No, uh, the, the word, my community, I found this, uh, the name, my community, five years ago in Delft, while chatting with the, my uh, students in Japan. And I found the, the name, my community. If the, the interface becomes personalized, then what the experience is going on? Experience is also going to the personalized, then the people are, tend to work only in the, my, its own community. Then the receiver will also work in the, the, his community or her community. It's also the my community. So the compar uh, uh, in, co in comparative to those two diagrams, the development of the interface, the personalized and uh, easy to use for the one person, it makes, tend to separate the interface. That is the, introduced by uh, the 20 years ago. Now, and when the inter interface is introduced, no, uh, that there is a similar story. The interface is very important because the people are using the object without knowing the mechanism. But nowadays, the interface becomes more and more wider. So, the what is the problem, or the what is the research target is, how can we connect to uh, the, those two communities? That is the, possibly the target of the, the future, the research for design, the synthesis with the comprehensive human process. What is the comprehensive human process? That is possibly love, adoration, the play, pleasure, respect, reward, participation, all those are the very a human a process, kind of human process. But it's very difficult to 
uh, to use those no, no, uh, human process in the mechanism. So, but the, I don't think uh, we have to develop a new the programming method or the new mechanism for the design uh, you, uh, the, uh, <coughs> using the love or uh, the play or pleasure. But we have to we have to think of those uh, the mechanism human uh, process is very important to keep the, to or connect the individual communities together. So this is the, the kind of futuristic term, the, the vision of the communication in re, uh, cancer research. And so possibly no time is running on and you're out? No, it's okay. Uh, so the, for those kind of the, uh, the vision, I will introduce you know, some the uh, research result for design, uh, cancer research result for design. The targets of the cancer research for design is explaining and evaluating the creativity. What is the creativity? This is our, uh, the question. What is the creativity? How can we, can, can we, can we uh, evalu uh, uh, explain the, or evaluate the creativity by some sort of the scientific method? That is the, the one curiosity. Understanding the structure of the mind. There are a bunch of the physiological the, uh, the method to measuring the brain, but the, those, those methods are not yet uh, measuring the mind, the process of the mind. They can measure the brain, the function of the brain, but they can't measure the mind, so that we are uh, applying the uh, understanding of the, uh, what, what we are using the uh, the, this concept process uh, to creating, so that uh, giving the the target for the physiological uh, the study team, the brain scientists, the, how to you know, get closer to the uh, understanding of the mind. It's long way, of course. Uh, explaining the compre uh, comprehensive characteristics of the human, therefore, the uh, from physiological and psychological approach. It, and developing a new method for design and communication. Those are the, so far, the target of the cancer research for design. And I will uh, explain uh, some uh, the typical researches. Uh, this is the color arrangement. Uh, this is the, for the explaining and explaining the, and evaluating the creativity. The, this the, the machine is the so-called NIRS, uh, Near Infrared spe uh, spectro Spectroscopy. <laughs> it uses the infrared la uh, the laser uh, beam uh, to measure the bread, the flow of the bread in the forehead or side head or everywhere. Where. And in this case, we try to measure the, uh, the, bread, uh, the blood flow on the forehead. And where, while the, uh, uh, applying the color arrangement task uh, and functional mapping of the human uh, cortex by uh, human front, frontal cortex by measuring the blood uh, the hemoglobin, uh, the concentrator associated with the new, uh, neural activity. You know? The task is this kind of way, uh, this kind of thing. Now there are three boxes, the very in a pair, but in the three boxes. And uh, we ask the subject to arrange three uh, colors. The first three, you know, uh, ask the, peop the person, uh, subject, to simulate, uh, to, to make the same arrangement to the, the sample. That is without the creativity task. And then the giving a one color Determine uh, the beforehand, then the, uh, asking them to uh, uh, select, arrange two colors for uh, under a certain uh, the concept words. Now the experiment is based on the various uh, uh, 
uh, influenced by cancer words. That uh, there is uh, some sort of a word. No, it's a uh, kind of core or the code or a war. No, no that's kind of the, the, the word. Then the subject is asked to arrange two colors and three colors or one color. This kind of, in this situation, oops, sorry. The result is, with this kind of the research, uh, of course we can measure the, the, you know, the flow, blood flow in a frontal cortex, but the re analyzing the result, they suggest that design trained people are more cognitively creative than when trying to arrange two colors than three colors. Two colors than three colors. No? The, it was a very interesting. No, the, uh, uh, the result shows the, only the arrangement with the two colors. The one color is fixed and asked uh, to, to use the two colors and arrange it to according to the, some typical uh, the, uh, adjective uh, word. That is a more tough task for the designers or using the frontal cortex. No, not, not the tough, but no, using the frontal cortex. That is the evidence. Not, uh, this difference is not appeared in the uh, perceived for the design untrained people. Design untrained people, for, for design untrained people, the all tasks are the kind of similar. But the design trained people, no, that means no, the word, target word, and one single color, the two different kinds of the constraints, it makes the things are difficult. And the two designers you know, suddenly working, not using the, the, the thinking about that, you know, how to do that, not how to solve that situation. But uh, without the, any constraints, just for the single constraint, you now with the adjective word, it is comparatively uh, easier or the, uh, for the designers. That is the kind of the results shows. Another one is the, uh, the understanding of the structure of the mind. <clears throat> In this uh, experiment, we also, also use the design trained and untrained people. No, that's be, that is the, the kind of the, uh, com, uh, connection to the design uh, research. Psychological measurement to measure user associative behavior. The research aims the, at the studying human mental uh, behavior while categorizing the products. Now, in this case, no, we prepared the 50 the pictures, and differences were found in the, asking the subject to categorize the, the pictures. And differences were found between the design trained and uh, design untrained uh, subject. The first three, design trained people tend to create a greater number of categories than non-trained uh, design people. Non, uh, that means uh, design, create, uh, design trained people tend to apply a l more categories than the design untrained people. That is uh, kind of uh, understandable. And, but at the same time, design trained people tend to uh, concentrate preferred product in a few number of the categories. Non-trained people tend to dispatch in the preferred product in various categories. That means you know, design untrained people, if they ask to categorize the object, they categorize the object without evaluating. But a design trained people categorizing of things as much as possible, applying the as much categories as he knows, but at the same time, he always thinking about you know, what is I prefer, what the evaluation process is, the simultaneously occurred. This is the kind of key point of the, uh, the structure of the mind. We are the using the brain, brain the res as a resource of the, the as a resource of the thinking. The brain is a kind of the limited the, the organ. So the, we are trying to use the brain efficiently. That is the kind of the uh, effect of the education. This is the, the brain measured by the uh, functional magnetic resonance uh, imaging, fMRI, the system. Uh, in this case, now we 
prepared uh, more than 20. Uh, uh, this experiment is done and directed by the, this, this uh, lady, no, Ms. Yama, uh, Ms., uh, Ms. Yamamoto. Uh, she is the, uh, the brain science uh, researcher. And uh, she uh, used the design topic. Now, in this case, uh, the subject is seeing the pencil, the, the ballpoint pen, and while looking at the ballpoint pen, the subject is asked to design the image, the new the ballpoint pen. Then, what's going on? They compare the two uh, different kinds of the educator people. And the red part is design non-educator ac people's activity, and the green part is design educator uh, people's activity, and uh, the yellow is the, are the common activity. This means the untrained people use the, the greater area of the brain. So the education uh, change, uh, f affects to the brain usage of the more compact, no? more compact, effective. But not only the effective usage. Now looking at the, the left under the picture, this is the, the picture from uh, looking from the bottom. Now, there are some more no, no, uh, green part. That is the, the typical uh, the functions. Uh, with the design educator people. These areas are so-called hippocampus. Hippocampus. Hippocampus means no, it's, it's a connection between the short-term memory and the long-term memory. No? The, while uh, designing, thinking about designing, the design trained people suddenly you know, using the short-term memory and the long-term memory, referring to the, his own, their own experience suddenly. That is the kind of the, uh, the result of the education <laughs> or the experience. So the, we try to measure you know, the behavior or the kind of the, the categorizing activity, and at the same time, the measuring the, the brain directly. And then the, we are uh, trying to understand the, what's going on in the brain. And the, but the, not only the, the measuring the, the physiological the parameters, the, we are uh, trying to develop new methods for design. In design, uh, the interdisciplinary context, a metaphor is created for the, the, the knowledge sharing. Now, the, uh, here is the, the, the another uh, explanation of the evoked metaphor. Uh, we named the, uh, the some sort of the, uh, the process of the mind as the evoked metaphor. The evoked metaphor is the tool for the intuitive uh, communication, understanding and expression in the design group. In this case, now we assume that the evoked metaphor can be a the uh, communication tool. To now from the discipline, now we can uh, the force ourselves to evoke a some, some sort of metaphor and express it. Then we can communicate with, uh, with uh, each other. Then using this uh, process, uh, we can. I think we can. Uh, develop a new method for design. Uh, usually, no, the, with the data or a bunch of the pictures, or uh, analyzing it and explain it. This is the kind of traditional uh, or the uh, kind of, uh, very rational uh, way of the designing. But uh, when we shift the process to the using the evoked metaphor, not only the describing, but the using the metaphor and uh, try to communicate the, each other or the, with the, even within the designer, now we can uh, make another uh, bottom-up process. But the, the, to, do, to, to use the evoked metaphor uh, through, uh, effectively, we have to share the knowledge or share the experience. That is a, another import, uh, the difficulty and the important uh, point of this using the evoked metaphor. And this is the example of the uh, developing the, uh, using the evoked metaphor for developing an interdisciplinary communication system. This, the, the picture is a loft. Loft is the kind of big area. No? Now people are speaking in a, in a, in a different topic. But eventually, you know, some people are hearing the, uh, the, 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 the all the the end, uh, the people talk, talk all the end of the room. 
then the, uh, people can know. So in this case, uh, the in working uh, communication, uh, computer-mediated communication system, such as the optimized information flow, is missing. Then the, the, the upper one is the, the uh, symbolic picture of the email system. In the, using the email, we have to address the uh, receivers. And all the other people cannot uh, read the email. But uh, somehow, the, like a loft, lo in this case, loft is the evoked metaphor, working as the evoked metaphor. Like a loft, no? if we had a, the communication system, like a loft in the uh, digital world, we can have more kind, more natural, and more a humanic uh, the communication. But there are, of course, a lot of the difficulty so that to, uh, to make the, this MATIC system uh, possible, the technology should be based on the multi-agent technology, uh, recreating the loft inside of the digital system. But multi-agent is, in my way of thinking, the multi-agent, uh, since the, the, this kind of the, the program is programmed by the the binary code, and with, built up with the, some sort of the small definition, and definition and definition. Uh, the doubt is, uh, can we define our mind? So that it's a di very difficult you know, problem, you know, if, uh, even if we can use the matter agent. But this is the kind of imaginary topic. So that uh, we, we try to, we have to, to target this kind, that was kind of the uh, human-like, the human-based the communication system. Otherwise, we will miss a kind of a very important the effect of the situation, the effect of the co-owned the, the experience. So the future of the Kansai. Uh, the, the ongoing structuring of the Kansai research is aiming at the establishing a map of research fields related to Kansai project, uh, Kansai researches. And uh, so we are try, uh, now using, try, using to, uh, try to use this map and uh, place uh, the different discipline of the researches. Now how can uh, located in the where and where. And uh, of course, the inside of the, the mental process, we have to focus on the brain. Now among our researchers, the, it's, it, there are people targeted to the rewards what is the mechanism of the rewards in the brain? How can we expect that reward? <laughs> it's it's a, it's a very uh, difficult uh, thing. But uh, those, that's, that kind of the scientific approach is the only for the one pass in the brain. But the one, pass, one, one single pass in the brain is not the, the result of the mind so that we have to search on the multiple function of the brain altogether, then the, we, can, uh, we will get closer to the, the function of the brain. So we are willing to create an interdisciplinary collaborating network in order to provide cancer research a broader vision of human, uh, humankind and other cancer-related topics. And uh, this is the kind of geographical development of the cancer. The cancer research is uh, was born in Japan and successfully grown there. And currently, thousands of researchers are working on Kansai, and Kansai is a new vector of the national industrial development. Yeah, the, actually, you know, the, this year, the Japanese government declared that Kan, uh, Japan will emphasize the function of the Kansai for the development of products. But uh, even though, no, as, I div as I explained, the cancer is unknown. <laughs> yeah. no. I, would say, I was taught by the, my European students, never talk about, un uh, ne never use the word unknown. When, uh, when I use, start using the unknown, people will uh, lose the attitude to understanding. But, uh, Kansai is a kind of very ambiguous 
but the, it is a kind of very, we, we believe it's a very important the process or the, uh, the important process of the mind to, uh, to comprehend, comprehend the human the mind. And the recently, the cancer research started to explain, expand internationally and its link with design is to be strengthened toward the development of the human-based new technology. This call, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah, I think this, uh, the line, this call is open to all fields, all schools in the world, which may bring knowledge, support, and love to cancer research, or cancer research, or uh, competence, or the uh, emotion, or uh, affective, or another, any kind of words is okay, I think. Now, now all together, now we, are, we have to now focus on the, the humane-based mental process, uh, understanding it for the design process. That is my message for this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. That was interesting, wasn't it? A whole new way of thinking, a whole new way, a whole new approach to research. Our next speaker can, excuse me, can everybody calm down a bit? I'm the nervous one, okay? Our last speaker for today is Rombaut Frieling, and Rombaut is one of our former students, and he's now a master's student at RCA in London. And he's going to reflect on beauty and becoming a designer. Yes. Right, well, I'm very pleased, of course, to be here and to talk about design, which I really like. But most importantly, I'm very pleased to be in this magnificent area of design and to be able to develop myself as a designer. And we've sort of like learned today from Bill Buxton's talk that designers are not just able to create beautiful objects, but moreover should be in a position to, to create beautiful experiences. We've also learned how the design program here is able to educate this new type of designer um, in a very, very innovative way and in a way that is very valuable. And I think I can sort of say that because right at this very place, two and a half years ago, it was Stefan Wensven who handed me out my <laughs> bachelor's degree. So I'm, in a way, I'm sort of like a product of this whole program. Now, after that, I've traveled around a little bit, worked at different companies, and, well, I'm in London now. But what I want to talk about now is basically I want to give you a little bit of an insight in the user experience, if you like, of the design program here. What it is like to, to, um, to basically become a designer here and to, uh, how this has affected me during the program, but also especially after the program. Um, So this is going to be a very personal story, as you may figure, and it's not because I consider myself such a great designer at all, but it's just because I think there's a lot of intriguing beauties and values that we often don't really talk about, but that I think when we start talking about these things we could lead to a much greater appreciation of what we are actually aiming for and what we are actually doing in the field of design. Sorry, just go back to this one. Because I think it all starts with this sort of like amazing beauty that as designers you're able to entertain yourself and to create value by yourself. And I've figured, speaking to a lot of like other designers or design students, that a lot of people actually have grown up in environments that may have been bored or sad from time to time. But we have all managed to sort of like um, create values, uh, well, 
sort of thinking for ourselves and think about futures in those environments. And other people may be very bored, like living, just like doing the normal things. But when you start thinking and imagining other futures, that really, really entertain yourself. And especially if you're able to narrow it down on paper and work things out. So I really agree with Goethe, who says that boredom is the mother of the muse, and goat is, and sorry, and boredom is the source of creativity as long as you're able to, to create something positive out of it. Well, this is like a sledge that I made when I was really young, but you realize that when you actually are able to transfer all those ideas and things in the head to things in the world that you can actually use, that that is extremely valuable and more valuable than any product you can ever buy. <coughs> and I realized it even more when my mother died a year, a year ago and my brother and I decided to build and design her coffin, which is an extremely emotional experience, but just the very fact that you can manage and do this yourself and put the value of thinking and your own values into an object and into a memory gives you an amazing empowerment as a designer. And I guess it is this very feeling that brought me to the design program here. Because at the age of 18, which is rather early, or rather young in the Netherlands, you really have to decide what you're going to do with the rest of your life. And I had big trouble doing this, actually, because I was interested in so many fields that I couldn't really decide on a rational level what I wanted to do. But when I came here, a year before the program started, in 2000, I realized um, that there, there was basically there was nothing, there was no program, and it was a very messy room where some odd presentation was being given. But the thing that there was was this vision, a vision of, of creating value for the new world and to think about things on a conceptual level, but also being able to transfer it into products for the real world. <coughs> and this brings me to a second point that is very much stressed in this program here, and that has really intrigued me. That is that as a designer, you're discovering things all the time. And I do not want to point to discoveries in the term of inventions, in, sorry, in the sense of inventions or in the sense of, um, you know, inventing a new light bulb or discovering something that's new for everyone, but discoveries that you make for yourself as a heuristic way of learning. That obviously, as Stefan and Caroline already stressed, um, are central in the program of reflecting upon yourself. And it's about everyone probably here who's been a student really hated this very system where you have to write down what you've actually done and why you've done that and what went wrong and how you can learn from that and how you can improve upon that. But at some point if you realize that this way of communication is not that much about writing down what you've done, but it's much more a way of expressing and communicating your ideas, then um, you start, and, and also if your professors and tutors are able to react upon those ideas, then you start having really intellectual discussions that can drag you into areas that have been largely unexplored and are very, and you can really go beyond boundaries. And the beauty of this is that it has started with your own very insight and is not started by some lecture or some course that you went to. <coughs> Sorry, just one example was I started working on some sort of website structure uh, in which I wanted to get rid of the page metaphor and instead wanted to make something that consists out of multiple objects. Um, and I ran obviously into loads of problems. What do these objects actually mean if you create such a portfolio thing? And I realized that these were not technical questions, but these related basically to, to philosophical questions through these sort of like, well, discussions with professors. And that brought me basically in the field of philosophy. And I realized how much designers and philosophers in a way have in common. Um, I studied some ethics and some aesthetics and some philosophy of language and anthropology. And I realized that a lot of the things I had been thinking about are, that, that arose out of um, design problems actually related to philosophical themes that have been around for years, for ages. Such as also the, the dualism between the mind and the body, obviously, which was very central in human-computer interaction, human-product interaction at that time. 
but also the notion of a philosopher, like a designer, of being sort of an innocent observer of the world and trying to make sense of that world and seeing the world from a non-linear perspective, trying to really understand how everything relates to each other. <clears throat> and it made me realize at some point that, um, sorry, I should go to the next one basically, no, ah, I missed one, right. It made me realize in what an amazingly complicated world we actually live and how we have created that world. This is on, on the cliffs of Dover, um, where, you, where, you, where you walk around in this very nice natural area, but then you look down on the platforms where all the cars are driving around going into the ferries and into France. And you realize that we have actually all created this stuff. And you start asking this big why question. Why have we actually created this? And then I started realizing that I'd actually very much been living in this sort of like modernist world of trying to aim for higher efficiency and cost reduction and even like projects that I did on timers were very, actually very much um, well sort of like framed in that framework. And it wasn't until that point that I really started to appreciate the value of art as well because that's really about generating meaning and value and that the role of the designer is not to design for efficiency or these things, but to really create value. I guess that the main sort of contributor to this sort of enlightenment, if you like, has been the fact that design gives you this amazing opportunity to go abroad and to work in different places because design is such a global activity. But also, and I think this is a very interesting time that we live in, it has been easier and cheaper to go into other places than there's been ever before. And it's only when you go out of the place where you've lived, ever, well, where, where you've always lived, that you start to um, not take things for granted anymore. When I came here this morning and when I get back to London, I will, just like in a snap second, I will realize, oh yeah, the car's on a different side of the road, which is very banal. But on the other side, it makes you realize that Actually, you live in a system that has been created. Also, working around at different places makes you realize that although design consultancies all have those same Ptolemaeo lights, for some reason, and design consultancies look very similar, they work in totally different ways. Like working in Germany, you realize that people are quite skeptical about strange ideas. But then in the end, if they really want to do something, they do it really, really solidly and they create something that's, that works very well. Whereas the, the English people are, are like amazing, like, yeah, that's all great. And then in the end, sometimes they don't really do it, to be honest. <laughs> it's just a different culture. But most importantly for design, you realize that all the products are very much sort of like an embodiment of culture. And it's not without any reason that the taps, for instance, that are found in California, do not give users the opportunity to control the volume of water that comes out of the shower. <coughs> I guess one of the most, well, more sort of like marketing experiences has, had been, has been when I did this project in China, uh, where you see basically the whole consumerist society coming up and growing and making this transition from a more value or tradition driven culture to, well, this consumerist society that we actually want to get rid of, maybe. Um, and you realize that in this sort of culture, it is actually the products that have the power to transform people and to transform lives, to change the way we live, more than any like government religion uh, has. And this obviously gives an enormous responsibility to us as designers to, to, if we want to change the world, if we want to change society into more sustainable or more ethical or, well, at least less consumer societies, then that should start with creating designs that reflect the culture or that provoke a new culture. And this brings me, this is not just responsibility, I think it's also very beautiful that actually we can create this positive change. <coughs> and although it's really nice to have your first product on the market, 
you realize that such a bloody alarm clock is not going to make any difference to the world. Um, but things that do can make a difference is this quite conceptual project that I just did for O2 um, in the UK, where we basically proposed a service that teaches children how they can also achieve digital functionality in an analog way, and that they get rewarded for that by getting actually this digital functionality. So they have to turn off their phone for a while in order to get reception time. And they have to first like, go on sort of like a treasure hunt through the city in order to obtain GPS on their phones. But it doesn't need to be so um, conceptual and so complicated in a way. Um, it could all, if we go back like, to this American tab, it could also be materials and, and, and things that we experience during everyday life that can make a difference, such as these uh, wall patches, basically, that give you a totally new view on the world, and it's like split up, that fragment, basically, all the views and create a new outlook. And obviously, you can only do this when you create stuff. Well, it's already been very much stressed by Caroline that drawing stuff and this like, ongoing photoshopping of things and ongoing making sleek renderings, which there are so many designers around who are very good at that, doesn't really make a difference. That is what like, results into those radios that I just showed. Unfortunately, like here, I've been very much trained in working with electronics and mocking up things as soon as possible, which I think is, is, is a big foot in the door if you want to get into design and industry, because they now really start to realize that you know, electronics, prototyping is sort of like, it, there's some future in that. On the other hand, um, I also realized that, although electronics are great, if you look, if you want to create user experience, it's not just electronics that sort of like are able to let products behave. It's also this beauty of making things and working with materials that you realize that you can create objects that behave but do that because a material has been formed in a particular way. Um, but the most important thing, apart from all this like, technical explorations, obviously, is that it gives you the opportunity to throw things in the world and to make discoveries about the world. For instance, this like, stupid headset test thing where, where I wanted to get like, tourists to have a different experience of what it is to be a tourist. I just gave them these things and then I realized actually that this completely changed their vision of Buckingham Palace uh, Square because I started walking around in different ways and talking about each other what they were seeing from those different perspectives. But also this good old and almost famous Simotion project um, where we created objects that elicited emotions not just through form but also through um, also through interaction. And only when you make these things in the real world, you can create discoveries and you can slowly try to innovate, not just in a technical way, but also in a very, well, embedded in a social, cultural way. Although designers are very good at giving, giving form, giving shape to things and, and making stuff, um, I think there's also, it's a little bit misleading and I catch myself on the fact that I, I always wanted to make stuff and I was really passionate about the solutions. But if we really want to change things, we shouldn't be so passionate about the solutions, but we should be much more focused on the problems or opportunities, rather, and the vision that we actually want to achieve. And I think, in a way, it's more and more valuable to see the designers as an entrepreneur rather than someone who just gives shapes shape to things, because it's the entrepreneurs that actually are able to change the world, if we want to do that. <coughs> Fortunately, one of, the, one of the amazing, or one of the most important things of this, like, being entrepreneurial is to, to be able to collaborate and to work in teams. And although this has been very hard for me, and I figure for a lot of people in the very beginning of this program here, where everyone is supposed to work together, and, you know, you come from various backgrounds and even in, well, I mean, we were all Dutch, but there's still a large variety in like the way we work. And when you're so young, it's quite hard to do that. 
But now I really start appreciating his ability to work in a group, especially now I'm working in more multidisciplinary teams. Because like here it was often the, fact, often the case that you know, we were all working as designers and we all wanted to do sort of like the same thing. But now when I'm working with a, with a Mexican journalist who is like amazingly good at sort of like positioning our design um, proposals into, into a social cultural setting, or working with a structural engineer who's like very skilled in making, in devising solutions that do not need electronics and things that, and teaches me things that I could have never come up with myself. Or the Italian architect who really drags me out of this modernist framework of efficiency into a more value and quality of life driven approach. <coughs> well, I've tried to show you a little bit of my sort of like beautiful experiences about design, um, which are six, but obviously it wouldn't, get, it wouldn't be complete if there were no, not seven. Um, the seven beauties, of course. And that's actually something that I found over the summer when I met up with a lot of like old friends that I hadn't seen for ages, basically. Partly because I was never really able to, to explain what design was about. And I thought I was just working and working and working and working for nothing. And now they went, into, went to work for investment banks and lawyer firms and big corporations. And they were basically working, 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 working. And they didn't have a private life anymore. And they realized that they had been doing this, or they are doing this, only to create like, status and raise more money. And then finally I could explain what the beautiful value of design actually is. That I can do things because I'm passionate about it myself and not because of external values. Um, I realized that a lot of the people I work with, like in a professional way, have also become friends. <coughs> Professors have become friends. You go and do strange things like going on helicopter trips to islands. But what I really want, the point that I really want to make here is that design gives you the ability, I know that's funny, the design gives you the ability to truly reconcile your personal development and your, well, professional development. Because on those both pursues, basically, your aim is to become more human. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.